And what I'd like for you to do is to look over these questions. There's seven questions, and these are with regard to some demos we're doing. And I know you can look this stuff up, but don't look it up right now. Um, look through these questions, see if there's any one of these that you don't think you can answer. And I'm going to give you about two or three minutes here to discuss with your neighbor any answers to these questions, what you think it is, and then I'm going to give you a chance to answer these. These are not on the Socratic app. So let's go ahead, talk them over, figure out your answer. Boiling point, when we talk about a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point at 100 degrees Celsius is only at 100 degrees Celsius if we are at a pressure of one atmosphere. So if the pressure varies from one atmosphere, then the boiling point is going to vary as well. So if we go through then and look at answers to the next question, how should the answers to the next question compare to the first two? Should be the same thing. So whatever you answer in your first one should answer the same thing for all the rest of them because again, once it reaches the boiling point, the boiling point will remain constant. And what causes a difference in the boiling temperature is simply pressure. Um, anybody know what happens, let's say if I go to Denver, Denver's the mile high city. We're trying to boil water there. What do you think it's going to boil at in Denver? More or less. It's a higher altitude. It's going to be less. It's going to be less. And that's because when we talk about water boiling, and we can look at something like this, if we talk about water boiling, it turns out that we don't need that sitting here anymore. Let's say that we look at a beaker here, a water, a container of water, and what happens is that when a substance boils, the water molecules try to escape. They try to go from the liquid phase into the gaseous phase. But acting down here on the surface is the atmospheric pressure. And when that atmospheric pressure is large, that is there's a whole bunch of molecules colliding to that surface, it's going to make it more difficult for these water molecules to escape. And if there's fewer of these collisions with the surface, let's say we knock out about half of these here. There we go. Get rid of some of these. And now we may be looking at something like this. With fewer collisions occurring on the surface, there's more opening and spaces for these molecules to get out, and they will escape into the atmosphere much easier. And as a result, then the boiling point will go down. So this is not an inverse proportion, but what it, or would this be direct? Pressure goes down, so the boiling point goes down. So I guess we wouldn't say it's a direct proportion, but it is some sort of direct relationship. And that is, as the pressure goes up, so does the boiling point. As the pressure goes down, so does the boiling point. But it's not a proportional mathematical relationship where if we double one, we double the other. But there is, again, some sort of relationship between the two. Um, anybody do canning or have parents or know somebody that does canning? Now, what's one of the things that you do when you, or you might do when you can veggies? Pressure cooker. Pressure cooker, exactly. And so, now I know that's kind of a lost art today, but in a pressure cooker, basically what you do, you take this big pot, and you may have heard of the pressure cooker, um, got a lot of publicity about, what was it, two or three years ago in the Boston Marathon when the bombing occurred there. They uh, stuffed these pressure cookers full of uh, explosive chemicals and they exploded. Well, a pressure cooker is a really thick walled metal container. And then you put this lid on the top and you seal it up real tight, you clamp it down or whatever. And the whole idea then is to build up large amounts of pressure. And in canning, why would we want to build up large amounts of pressure? I hear two, go ahead. Yeah, part of it is to preserve it, and the other is to seal it, yeah. Uh, preserve it and seal it, and that's probably a third, probably the most important reason is, and that is to prevent um, contamination of the foods. Um, you want to make sure that all bacteria and whatever else, else are killed. So there's a few bacteria that can survive at uh, temperatures close to 100 degrees, so by clamping it down, we increase the pressure. If we increase the pressure in here, what happens to the boiling point inside that pressure cooker? Boiling point is going to go up. And then as a result, you're going to wind up killing off 
uh, do a much better job of killing off any of those bacteria that's in there. Now, interesting enough, the most common bacteria um, that, uh, or toxin that might be found in there is botulism. And uh, you don't hear much about that anymore in terms of a food contamination. Anybody know where you find botulism? Botox. Botox, yeah. And so we've taken this uh, thing, which is actually a, a toxin in your food, and we've turned it into some sort of uh, chemical that's used in uh, cosmetic procedures. But if you ingest um, botulism, you can wind up getting very, very ill as a result. And so very often, these pressure cookers are used to uh, kill off those materials. All right, so looks like we've established that it's leveled off here. And what this is telling us is that the pressure here in Coon Rapids Day must be what? High or low? Low. At least compared to a pressure of one atmosphere. So the pressure here must be less than one atmosphere. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop that. And, and uh, usually, though it's not the case today, usually when I see a boiling point less than 100 degrees Celsius in here, or it's even like less than 99 today, it's usually associated with pretty crappy weather. Um, we'll look outside and we'll see um, it raining or foggy or something else. So the fact that we have some nice weather out today, it's kind of unusual that would see that. But I have not looked at the forecast. I don't know what sort of fronts are moving through or whatever. So next up here, I'm going to go ahead and put this water on. And we're going to let this heat for a while. And anybody see where I put my rubber stopper? Here we go. So we'll let this heat for a bit. And hopefully this will heat to the point where I can use it at the end. And uh, what I'm trying to do in this one here is I'm trying to heat it up to the point where we fill this entire container with water, both in the gas liquid phase and in the gaseous phase. So right now, what's in the space above the water? Air, right. And so by boiling it, I'm going to convert some of that liquid water into gaseous water. And the hope here by heating it is that we displace that air that's in there and replace it all with water. OK, next up, we look at what happens to water molecules when water boils. So we say things like they move around fast. They speed up and disperse. They are separated. They speed up and collide faster. The water evaporates, they speed up. So these are all pretty good. These are all pretty good. So again, um, you can talk about them speeding up. You can talk about them separating from each other. We don't talk about the water molecules separating, but that is the molecule itself separating. But rather than uh, them staying together, they wind up moving apart from each other and changing into the gaseous phase. Okay, primary substance found in the bubbles of boiling water. Let's see. We have air, nitrogen, oxygen. So we have a whole bunch of possible answers. Fortunately, darn, this is one of the things that we can show. I kind of need to go back and put this one on here, if I can. So while we're putting that back on and heating it, there is something that I demonstrated earlier in here. And I can make this boil a little faster by pouring some of that off. There we go. And I'm going to fill this up with water. Now, fortunately, I know one of the things that you've done in lab this semester is you've tested for the presence of different gases. So we've used to test for gases either a flaming splint or a glowing splint. So I'm going to go ahead and take out the burner and we'll put on some safety glasses here. We'll get the burner going. There 
And somewhere here I have my splints. Now just in case, I'm going to go ahead and put this up here. Because after all, if we have some hydrogen in here, what's going to happen? Well, of course, nothing is going to happen there. In fact, we see a little glowing ember. And so if there's oxygen in there, what should happen to this glowing ember? It should ignite. Notice what's happening to it when I put it in. It's glowing now. What happens when I put it above there? It starts to go out. It starts to go out there, yeah. So we must not have hydrogen in there. We must not have oxygen in there. And carbon dioxide would extinguish that real rapidly. <laughs> so we have another thing that we've done with these. And I'm going to go ahead and move this out of here. And so here's something else we've done earlier this semester. We'll take this bucket of water and we're going to take these pop cans and we're going to heat these up over the flame. And for the first one, we're simply going to take a empty can of water, uh, empty can of air. And so this one here, see there's nothing in it, so we just have air. We're going to heat this one up until it gets smoking hot. And now that we have it nice and smoking hot, we'll invert it into here, and we see that nothing happens. Okay, we go from here to putting a small amount of water in here. And we want just a small amount in the pop can. And we'll now heat this up until this one gets smoking hot. Of course with the water in here, this is going to take longer or less time to heat. A little bit longer. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to fill this pop can with steam. steam, with water vapor. Want to displace the air in here. And we see when you do that, the can winds up collapsing. And so what we've shown then is that it must not have air in there because if it had air in there, we know that a can filled with hot air would not collapse. So those bubbles then must be producing water. water. So what should make sense because what type of change is occurring when we boil water? It's a physical change. We start with water and we end with water. The bubbles that are in there would have been whisked up again? Water. Exactly. So what's in the bubbles of boiling water? It is water. Okay, so if you didn't know that, get it written down. Number six. Is it, the, is it possible to boil water without heating it? All right. No, because you need heat to boil something. Yes. Using pressure like a vacuum. Yes. Okay, what's this one say? Everything is possible. Probably, but I don't know how. Nah. All right. Well, there was a couple people that were here early when I was practicing a bit. And so I do have a device where we are going to demonstrate this. And in fact, we can get it to boil by changing the pressure. So what I have up here is a vacuum pump. And I better turn this fire off so I don't put a thing on. Okay, good. We're going to let it keep going for a while. We want to get this thing boiling real vigorously. It's, 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 
That's okay. So we are going to put some water into here. And you'll see, you notice that this is a deionized water tap. Now the first few bubbles, I will acknowledge for those that did answer previously air, those first few bubbles that come out would be air simply because we look at this right now, these bubbles that are in here are air. But once they come out, the bubbles that come out when we boil it are in fact water. And what I'm going to do here, I think we'll have Sam be the thermometer reader today, if you can go ahead and that's fine. Yep. Put it however you need it. And see if you can read the temperature off of there. It looks like it's 23 degrees. 23 degrees. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hook this up to the vacuum pump. Oh, before I do that, I want to show you how this vacuum pump works. So we'll hook up the hose here to the vacuum pump. Turn this on. Sticky maker, right? Okay, so at 22 degrees Celsius, nobody's ever done that, right? Oh, I admit it, you have. Okay, so now we're going to let this kind of get going. And we'll see here by reducing that pressure, we're now causing the water to boil. So now the question is what do you think's happened with the temperature? Has the temperature gone up? Down? No. I don't think it's gone up. How about down? No. How about stay the same? Yes. Alright. I'm just turning it however you need to. Yeah, it's still 23. Okay. And if I let this go for a little while, um, what we might see is that that temperature will begin creeping downward. And we'll let this go for about. Uh, problem. We'll let this go for about um, 30 more seconds. And we'll see if it's creeping downwards at all. Turn it this however we need to. And where are we at right now? Alright, and it turns out that the longer we keep this going, the temperature would continue dropping on down from there. Now, something else we can do with this, watch when I remove the hose from the container, watch what happens to the walls of the container here. And I'll try not to shake this so you can see. But you should have seen the condensation form very rapidly on the side. And I hook this back up and that condensation should begin disappearing as it boils. a little while for that water to begin boiling again. And then once it begins to boil, I'll remove the hose again. And we should see the condensation form on the walls as soon as I remove that hose. So when you look at there, and you see that instant formation of condensation that forms on the walls. And that formation of condensation should tell you that what's happened is that when this water boils, it's filling the space up above the liquid with water molecules. And when then I um, increase that pressure instantaneously, it causes all those water molecules that are in the gaseous phase to condense back in the liquid phase, and that deposits it onto the walls. And in fact, that is sometimes how fog forms. Fog often forms when the air is saturated um, with water vapor. Uh, very often, fog will form when the temperature drops but also very slight changes in the pressure can cause that condensation of the water droplets as well to form the fog or possibly even raindrops when there's a quick change in that pressure. Now this here has been boiling for a few minutes and the key to success on this one is to let it boil for a few minutes and we are going to now remove it and seal it up. And again, the whole idea of letting it boil for several minutes was to do what? Build up the Not build up the pressure. We wanted to fill up this space with water molecules. We wanted to displace all of the air that was in there. 
So I'm going to need to remove this from here and we're going to put that rubber stopper back in there. You'll see now that it's still boiling a bit and this is going to be hot. So I'm going to grab a couple paper towels to pick this up and we're going to take this now and turn this around over here. going to pour some water into here. I'm going to fill this up with water. We're going to have some nice cold ice water. And in order to get this to boil, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pour ice water over the top. Ooh. By pouring the ice water over the top, don't worry, this won't break. Well, it never has in 25 years. Okay. So you can see that the more ice water we pour over the top, the faster we get this thing to boil. Okay, notice now how it stopped. Pour the ice water over the top, it boils. So, any idea how this one works? You look puzzled. Why does, I'm just wondering why the glass isn't breaking. Um, well, it's able to withstand 14.7 pounds per square inch. You might remember that the 14.7 pounds per square inch is atmospheric pressure. Remember, we had that metal bar out? So, it's able to withstand that the glass is thick enough to withstand that and you're thinking though because of the cold maybe or the difference in temps? Well because we're servers and like if we if the glasses come out of the dishwasher and we put water in them our glasses always break. Yeah this is Pyrex. So this is a different type of glass. Pyrex is much stronger. Yeah. I thought for sure it was going to break us. No. <laughs> no 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 it, it could. Um, granted I say it's never done it in 20 some years if there was a slight crack in here though it probably would have broken already when I was heating it up so if it didn't crack when I was heating it up it's not shouldn't crack I, should, I shouldn't say it won't but it shouldn't crack here when I pour this over the, the top. Are you going to jinx me? <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Any ideas how that works? Pressure build up? It's not a pressure build up because there's a pressure build up what should happen to the the stopper. The stopper would have flown off. Yeah, the stopper would have come out of there. So the stopper's not coming out, so how is it? I can pour <coughs> ice water over the top and make it boil. Oh, here comes another one. I just love this. I've been doing this how many years? I'm still fascinated <laughs> by this. Any ideas though? It's not a pressure build up. Well, it actually would work. The, other, the reason why I flip it upside down is because it gives me a nice water uh, surface to pour the water over. It works either way, but if I pour it over this little spout here, it, it spreads out over the top and will not uh, go down over the sides. Well, remember I said the key to success on this one was to make sure that all of the air was removed. And the only thing that's in here right now is water. We have water in the liquid phase down here and water in the gaseous phase up here. So what happens is when I pour the ice water over the top what does that do to the speed of the water molecules that are up here? Causes them to slow down. If they slow down, they're going to want to leave the gaseous phase and go into the 
liquid phase. If they go into the liquid phase, what does that do to the pressure above the surface? It will cause it to go down. If molecules leave here, if there's less molecules, then that's going to cause the pressure to go down. And the pressure goes down, just like we observed with the vacuum pump here, what happens to the boiling point when we decrease the pressure? The boiling point will go down as well. So really what we're doing then is we're lowering the pressure in the space above the liquid. That's again another part of the key to success on this one by inverting it. Um, I want to make sure that this portion up here does all get cooled down and the hot water um, the water itself, the liquid, has a very high, what we call, specific heat capacity, and it retains the heat a lot better. These gas molecules will leave, go into the gas, uh, into the liquid phase. As a result, the pressure drops, and so does the boiling point. And so I can keep doing this all day. In fact, now I'm going to repeat this in my afternoon class, but when I repeat it in the afternoon class, I will then take this uh, flask and I will set it in the back. You need to remember to remind me, though, and if you remind me, on next Tuesday, I'll pull this back out. This will have returned to room temperature by then, and we should be able to cause this to boil at room temperature next Tuesday. <coughs> so right now it's still, well, now it's uh, cool enough for me to pick up and hold on to, but it's still pretty warm. Remember, when I first started, it, I could not pick it up at all. So any questions on this one? All right, last up here. Question was, is the process of boiling evaporation an endothermic process or exothermic process? Well, for this one now, what I'm going to do is I have in this bottle some isopropyl alcohol. And where do we find isopropyl alcohol? You find this at home where? This is found in rubbing alcohol. This is the alcohol found in rubbing alcohol. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to walk around, and if you wish to see how this feels, um, and you don't have any cups in your hand, I go ahead and put your hand out, and then when I put on a few drops, go ahead and blow over the surface of it and see how it feels. If you don't want to feel it, then don't put your hand up. So, anybody want to feel? Put out your hand. Is it going to burn? No. <laughs> this is just rubbing alcohol. <laughs> and if you don't want to do it, don't put out your hand. This is rubbing alcohol. <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> temperature cool and that's because this process let's see how we did here is an endothermic process the process of boiling and evaporation is an endothermic process it's one that absorbs energy from its surroundings so as it was evaporating off your hand what was happening is it was absorbing the heat out of your body and that's why it felt cool Okay, so again, when we talk about endothermic, it's when we say that energy is absorbed from the surrounding. <coughs> Your hand didn't get hot when you blow it, because if it did, if this was an exothermic process, your hand would have gotten hotter because it would have 
release heat to your hand as it evaporated. Same way when you boil things. And, and part of the reason why people get this one wrong is we think, well, ordinarily when we boil something, it's often warm. But remember, it's actually absorbing heat out of the hot plate. If you think about this, if I take this off of the surface of the hot plate, what is it? what happens to the temperature of the hot plate? It goes up. I put this back on there, what happens to the temperature of that surface? It goes back down. And it goes down because what it's doing is it's taking heat out of that hot plate. And if I'm just letting this sit here, it's not boiling or anything. And so when Sam was reading those temperatures, we did not do this for very long, but we did see a very small degree what happened to the temperature as that water was boiling in this flask over here. The temperature was going down just a little bit. And so we make use of this as humans a number of different ways. In fact, our body makes use of it. And how does our body make use of this phenomenon? And some of us are going to start feeling it today in these rooms. We're going to start sweating. Okay? You start working out, you start sweating. And the purpose of sweating is actually to keep you cool. Mm -hmm. And that's because when you sweat, you get some water on the surface of your body. And as that water evaporates, that process will cool us down because it's absorbing the heat out of our bodies. And it's causing that sweat to turn from a liquid into a gas. And just much the same way, it's a little more dramatic here with the uh, rubbing alcohol. But when this evaporated off your hand, you notice how this cooled down. It's the same thing when the water from the sweat evaporates off your body, it will cool us down. Now, uh, one of the ways that we can keep all of this straight is this. Uh, first of all, if we make a diagram like this, uh, we're going to look at solid, liquid, and gas. And I want to arrange a solid, liquid, and gas so that the lowest, the one we put on the bottom has the lowest energy, the one we put on the top has the most energy. And so if we talk about a solid, liquid, and a gas, which one of those phases has the most energy? Right. So here's what you're going to do if you want to keep these things straight. Just make a quick drawing showing the solid, liquid, and gas. And again, we're arranging these with a high energy up on the top and the low energy on the bottom. And depending upon the direction that we go, if we go in this upward direction, in order to get to a higher energy, it has to absorb energy. So anything that goes in this direction must be an endothermic process. Because again, in order to get to a higher energy state, it has to absorb some energy. So it would absorb that energy from the surroundings. That's going to be an endothermic process. Anything that goes in this direction to lower energy is going to be an exothermic process. So what that means is that when we went from a liquid to a gas, that is when we caused that to evaporate off of our hands, that process of evaporation going from a liquid to a gas was endothermic. So if going from a liquid to a gas is endothermic, that must mean when we go from a gas to liquid, that process is exothermic. It's one that's going to give off heat. And now there's a number of ways that we use that as well. And one of the ways is, let's say that we look at a construction of a house. Okay. Now again, I probably mentioned before, I'm not an artist. so. We'll just kind of have to imagine this is my house right here. And if you have a central air conditioning unit, where does that central air conditioning unit sit? It sits outside. So let's say we have a central air unit that sits out here. And I'll abbreviate central air like this. Now, what happens is that from the central air unit, there is some piping that goes in the house. And this goes into your furnace. And then that piping comes back out into the air conditioner. Now, if you've ever felt the air coming off the central air unit out here, how does that air feel? 
very warm. It's very warm air. And of course, if you feel you have a fan blowing over these coils on the inside, how does the air in the house feel? Well, obviously, it's an air conditioner, so it's going to feel cool. And that's because we have two different processes occurring in here. Inside of the central air unit is something called a condenser or compressor. Now, actually, if you're in the business, you're going to distinguish between a compressor or a condenser. Um, for us, we really don't need to distinguish between them because they basically refer to the same thing. But what happens is this, is that inside of these coils is some sort of refrigerant and some sort of liquid. When that liquid goes into the house, what happens is that liquid will evaporate. So again, that liquid gets shot into the house inside of these uh, pipes. Now it doesn't get go into the whole house itself. It stays in those uh, pipes here, but that liquid inside of here is going to evaporate. And as we saw, the process of evaporation is in what type of process? An endothermic process. So it is going to absorb heat from the surroundings. And what are the surroundings it's going to absorb heat out of? It's going to absorb heat out of the house. So basically then, it will evaporate inside of these coils, and then it sends the gas back out here into the central air unit. Once it gets out of the central air unit, that gas will then be condensed or compressed. And so it turns from a gas back into a liquid. And we turn from a gas to a liquid, that process is exothermic, which is why when you stand outside of here, you wind up feeling the heat. Well, that liquid then gets shot back into the house where it will evaporate, it will absorb more heat out of the house, and gas goes back in here, gets recompressed back into liquid. So it's a continual process of condensation and evaporation that occurs here um, with that central air unit. And the only reason why it's a central air unit is because um, many of us are familiar with those, but actually all types of air conditioning work the same way. That's why if you have, instead of a central air unit, let's say if you have a wall unit, there's a reason why there's part of that thing that hangs out the window. And that part that hangs out the window is the part that you'll feel is really warm, and the part that is inside the house is one that feels really cool. So we basically try to separate the evaporation and condensation pieces. But part of the reason why a window unit isn't as efficient is because physically the two processes of evaporation and condensation are very close together. A central air unit is going to be more efficient because it separates the um, condensation and evaporation processes a lot further apart from each other. A refrigerator works the same way. Um, in a refrigerator, and if we now imagine this not as a house but a refrigerator, the refrigerator works the same way except this compressor condenser is built into a little box that sits here in the back of your refrigerator. You don't see it, it's that little compartment that sits in the back. But if you've ever felt the air that comes out from underneath the refrigerator, how does that feel? It feels warm. And that's because in the back side of that refrigerator, tucked in underneath, and even a freezer, there's a small compressor that sits there and it's doing the um, compressing and that's the air that you wind up feeling coming out of there and somewhere built into that frame of that refrigerator, the freezer, you have some coils there where the evaporation is occurring. Now another one that students often get um, mixed up is the transition between the solid and liquid phase. They go from a solid to a liquid. First of all, what do we call the process of converting from a solid to a liquid? If I put this in my hand, what's happening to this ice? It's melting. And how does my hand begin to feel? Cold. Cold. And that's because in order for it to melt, it is absorbing heat from my hand. Which means that the reverse process, that of freezing, must be in... Let's see, freezing would be converting from a liquid to a solid. That process is going to be exothermic process. Now, just like boiling, many mistake because we think it occurs at a higher temperature. Uh, many also mistake what's happening uh, in the process of freezing. And so one of the things that's done, and you're going to find this, I've placed it up here in your D2L notes for today. Um, 
Let's see, today is the 14th. One of the ways that this is used is in the winter, what will often happen is that there will be a freeze somewhere in California or Florida where a lot of the fruits and stuff are raised for us in the winter. And to prevent them from freezing, what they do is they spray like the citrus trees with water. And this actually prevents the fruits themselves from freezing. Now how does this work? Well, if you spray the, um, the trees with water, that water is going to then convert from a liquid into a solid. And when it converts from a liquid to a solid, that process is, again, exothermic, and it is going to release heat to its surroundings. In this case, the surroundings wind up being the fruit. And that then prevents the fruit itself and the tree itself from freezing. So it seems kind of counterintuitive if you ever go through um, kind of a, a, a citrus field um, or strawberry field, whatever they're, they're raising in the winter, you see these things covered with ice. And actually they're covered with ice. That's actually saving those uh, fruits because the process of freezing itself is exothermic and it's releasing that heat to prevent them from freezing. So these are some applications of this stuff. Um, any questions on anything we've covered here? today. All right, well because again I have a shorter class this afternoon, we'll have a shorter one here this, mor um, this morning and we'll see you later.